Hey, welcome to ACF Church, and we're so glad that you're with us watching this message online. And our hope is that it would encourage you to be more like Jesus and walk closely with Him as an apprentice of Christ. And our hope is to give away all of these resources for free as much as possible. It takes a lot of time and energy and people to make that happen. And if you'd like to support the mission of God financially for ACF Church, you can go to acfak.org and you can give there. Now enjoy the Word of God proclaimed. I've got friends who think they know me. They know what I say, what I do, and what I show them. But what I feel inside is still a secret. See, I've got a story to tell, but no one to tell it to. See, this is a decision I've made, a decision they've made, and a decision we've all made to hide ourselves in broad daylight. But up until that moment comes when someone turns the light on, I could have never dreamed what this would feel like to finally step into an unknown reality and make myself visible to just one person. Everything in me was saying, don't do it. Don't trust anyone. But the cost was too high in the dream, too big to pursue alone. See, with someone there who loves me unconditionally, I can finally be free from the impression of isolation. I thought I was made to be alone, but alone was just a decision that I made, and I don't want to make it anymore. Well, thank you. I am honored, as always, to get to be here to share with you this morning. Um, my family and I have called ACF home for just over 10 years. I currently help lead a ladies' Bible study. And so, again, we are wrapping up this week in our Never Alone series. If this is your first week joining us, we just want to say welcome, that there's a place for you, whether you are joining here in person, whether you're watching online at an outpost, Host, we need you and there is a place for you and hopefully as we've walked through this series you've been able to see regardless of your circumstance regardless of your situation no matter where life finds you that you are never alone that the God of the universe is walking with you whether you recognize that he is or not that he is big enough to know all of your needs and that he's close enough to hear your every single thought. And so today, like Brian said, alone as a parent. Maybe some of you hear that and you're like, sign me up. I want some alone time as a parent. But whether you are a parent or not, I hope that you know and can trust that the Holy Spirit is the perfect teacher and he can guide you today. He can lead you into his truth, again, no matter where life finds you right now. And so we're gonna start in Genesis chapter 16. If you have your Bible, the nice thing about Genesis, first book of the Bible, so it's right up front. And before I start reading in chapter 16, I kinda wanna just set the stage so that we're all on the same page as we begin. We're gonna read about a man named Abram. And maybe for some of you, he's more familiar as Abraham, but at this point in the story, God hasn't changed his name yet. So here is Abram, and starting in chapter 12 of Genesis, he is giving promises, he's given promises and blessings from God. God tells Abram, I am gonna make your name great. I am going to bless you. I'm going to bless the nations through you. And so God tells Abram, I need you to leave everything that's familiar. I need you to leave your father's house and I need you to follow me. And so at 75 years old, Abram takes his wife, Sarai, he takes his nephew, Lot, and he follows God. He's not given a plan of step-by-step -step instructions of how everything's gonna look, but he is simply told to follow God. A few years go by, and in Genesis chapter 15, God does something really cool, and it's called cutting a covenant. Again, God tells Abram, I am gonna bless you. I am going to make your descendants outnumber the stars in the heavens. And God does 
cutting a covenant, which is basically an agreement, okay, between two parties where they would say, I'm going to hold up my end of the bargain and you're going to hold up your end of the bargain. And to show that we're going to make it true, that we're going to make this agreement, we're going to sacrifice an animal. We're going to shed blood. We're going to cut a covenant. Well, in chapter 15, what is so cool is we read that Abram falls asleep. So basically what God is doing is he cuts the covenant with himself. God says, Abram, I'm going to bless you. I am going to make you great. And it's not going to depend on you one bit that God is faithful to himself. God is faithful to this word. And again, a few years go by, and that's where we find ourselves in chapter 16. Now, his wife, Sarai, is still barren. She still has no children. And so she figures that, well, God must be mistaken. He must need me to take matters into my own hands. And so therefore, I have a slave girl. Her name is Hagar. I'm going to give Hagar to Abram, and maybe I can raise a family through her. And so that is where we find ourselves in verse 4. When Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Isn't the Bible just a marvelous thing? <laughs> like, I think we can all agree that this is not a great circumstance. This is definitely a less than ideal situation. Here we have a slave girl who by no choice of her own becomes pregnant and becomes pregnant in a family that doesn't even want her. Maybe some of you right now find yourself in a less than ideal circumstance or a less than ideal situation. Maybe you're walking even as a parent through an uncomfortable time right now. Maybe you became a parent in a less than ideal situation. But what I hope you can see is that God knows. God sees, he hears, and he acts. And at this point in the story, it is good to note that only Hagar is with child. At this time in the story, Sarai does, is not pregnant. Only Hagar is. But instead of Sarai seeing an opportunity to come together, to support Hagar, to mentor her, to build a family alongside her, she sees Hagar as a threat. She sees her as competition. And I thought, how often do I make excuses for my less than ideal circumstance? Well, if only you knew my life, if, if only you knew where I've been or what I had to go through. Or maybe as a parent, do you see things as a competition, right? Like, do you find yourself comparing your responses as a parent with someone else's? Or do you compare the way that your kids respond with someone else's? I know that I can be very good at justifying my response while I judge someone else's. Because parenting can be such a show about what's on the outside, right? Like here we have these little images that we can just mold and we can shape into doing the right thing and saying the right thing and acting just the best ever, and we can use them as our measuring stick for success. Like we've all been in the checkout line, waiting behind that little kid that has to have that toy, and he's letting everybody know. Well, you know, if only the parents would just say this, or if only the parents would do this, well, then surely that kid would respond appropriately. But it got me thinking, no wonder why parenting can seem so isolating. Like my kids misbehave, 
So it's therefore something that I have said or something that I have failed to do. And so why would I want to reach out and ask anyone for help? Because, you know, they're probably going to criticize me. They're probably going to judge me for the way that I've responded. Or why would I even want to offer encouragement to someone when I can't even get parenting right? Like nobody's going to ask me for advice because have you seen my kids? (laughs) I love you kids. But in contrast to Sarai and Hagar, right, we have this couple that sees each other as a threat. They see each other as competitors. Think of Mary and Elizabeth. In Luke chapter 1, after Mary receives the visit from the angel that says, you are going to be the mother of Jesus, the word tells us that she hurries to the house of her relative Elizabeth. And I love verse 56 that says exactly that. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Can you imagine these conversations that they had? These conversations that were probably filled with joy and excitement, as well as fear and uncertainty. But they saw each other on the same team. They found a way to come together, to take time, to listen to each other, to encourage each other. And what I love is the fact that at this point, Mary is a teenager and Elizabeth is well beyond childbearing years. I loved being in the military, and I loved moving every two to three years, believe it or not, because I knew that no matter where we got stationed, I knew that there was going to be a group called Protestant Women of the Chapel. It was a group of ladies. We would get together once a week to worship God and to study God's word. And what I loved was the fact that I found ladies that were walking through the exact same things that I was walking through. And we could be in it together. We could share with each other. We could encourage each other. But even more than that, what I loved was the fact that there were some that were a few years ahead of me in life, as well as some that were a few years behind. Because what I want you to hear and understand, we say this at ACF a lot, don't we? Find your people. Find those who are walking through similar situations. Maybe you are still trying to have a family. Maybe you have kids that just won't leave. (laughs) Wherever you are in life, whatever situation in which you find yourself, find those that can walk through life with you. And in addition, find those that are a little bit ahead of you and a little bit behind. Because your experience, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you have something that can help someone else, 100% hands down. Because whether you think like you've been successful or not, maybe you feel like a failure. Guess what? A lot of times it's your failures that more people can relate to than your success. And so find those, surround yourself with others who are going to encourage you. They're going to support you and be on the same team. Back to Genesis. We've got Sarai, we've got Hagar. They are disrespecting each other. They're mistreating each other and Hagar has just run away. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to shore. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. 
Again, you gotta love God's word. That, that verse seven, we'll, we'll get to the rest, I promise. That verse seven though, the angel of the Lord, that is the first mention of this in the Bible. And many scholars believe that the angel of the Lord is in fact Jesus Christ, God himself. And so let's take notice, why does he come? And where is Hagar when he comes? Well, if you notice, where is Hagar? She's in the desert. She's in the wilderness. She is not where she is supposed to be. She is in a less than ideal situation and circumstance, and she finds herself in a less than ideal situation and circumstance. And still, he comes and he acts. And in verse 11, why does he come? It says, because the Lord has heard her misery. Even the name that he gives to her son Ishmael, it means God hears. God hears tears. I love that God hears the cries of the brokenhearted. He doesn't wait for your words to be proper or cleaned up. A couple weeks ago when Pastor Brian was sharing about prayer and he said, you know, a lot of times we overthink it, right? God hears our tears. He hears our distress. And I love the fact because I know that I have tried to teach my children. I have tried to model God's character, but I mess up. I have said things that I shouldn't say, and I have acted in ways that I don't want anyone to follow. And I have shed a lot of tears, but God hears. And the fact that he hears and he acts, because what does he tell her? He says, go back, submit to Sarai. When I can humble myself, when I can repent and ask for his forgiveness, he's right there. He hasn't moved. He is leaning in and he is bending close. Especially, let's think about what he tells her about her son. Well, he's going to grow up and just be a stellar example of a man. People are going to follow him and they're just going to look up to him. That's not what he says. He is telling a single mom, your son, he's going to give you heartache. And he's going to bring you pain and trouble. And he is going to stress you out to the highest degree. But he says, I will be with you. I will not leave you alone. And that is enough. He doesn't just say to her, go back, submit. Good luck with that. But he is the living one who sees her, who is with her, who hears her. And I love that that's exactly what she experiences in verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For he said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And this name that she gives God, El Roy or El Roy, it is the only time we see that name for God in the Bible. Did you notice what God's first words to her are back in verse 8? Hagar. Did you notice as we read earlier in the chapter that not even Abram and Sarai refer to her by her name? They call her the slave. They call her the servant. When not even members of her own family can show enough decency and call her by name, God does. God sees her and God hears her and God calls her by name. Because God's seeing is not just a passing glance. It is a personal touch. It is a continuous presence and it's an enduring promise. The living God sees you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. 
He knows the circumstance and the situation in which you find yourself. And he calls you by name. He is with you. He sees everything with perfect clarity. He sees your past. He sees your present. He sees your future. And Hagar understood that as well. And so I believe that's what gave her the strength to return. So sure enough, she goes back. She submits. And for 13 years, Ishmael is raised as a son and as an heir in Abraham's house. Uh, you know, things are going well for this teenager. He's loving life, having a, having a great time. And God is faithful to his covenant that he made with himself, with Abraham and Sarah, and their son Isaac is born. Oh, Ishmael, hold on. Enter sibling rivalry, right? Enter this competition for affection and for attention. And sure enough, in chapter 21, we start reading the fact that Abraham throws a great feast to celebrate the day that Isaac is being weaned, which basically means he's going from being a little baby into growing up and being a young boy. And so Abraham throws this party for Isaac, but Sarah catches Ishmael teasing and making fun of his little brother. And so Sarah says, nope. She goes to Abraham. She says, I'm not going to have this in my house. Abraham, you need to send them away. Verse 14. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Sound a little familiar? Once again, God hears the cries. God hears the pain and the distress, the hunger of the situation. And what I love is the fact that he doesn't criticize her for seemingly being in the same situation in which she found herself 15, 16 years prior, right? Here she is wandering in the desert, not where she's supposed to be. Here she is crying, thinking that she is a failure, thinking that her son is about to die. But he hears and he acts. And he doesn't give her a lesson on how to properly parent, but the word says that he opens her eyes and he fills a need. He opens her eyes and she sees a well of water. The word doesn't say that water appeared or that God made water appear out of nothing. It says she saw a well of water. I have a feeling that that well was there the entire time. Have you ever been so close to a problem where you did not see any way out? Where you could not see the solution? I think that sometimes God leads us to a place where we may feel like there is no hope, but where we are at that time is in fact the only place that we will be able to see things clearly. God opens her eyes. He gives her sight. He reminds her of perspective. And he does the same for us as well. And I think a lot of times he does that through other people. 
And that is why we need to surround ourselves with those who can speak truth, God's truth to us, to remind us of perspective when we can't see it for ourselves. And in verse 19, after he opens her eyes, the word says that she fills her water skin first, and then she gives the boy a drink. Moms and dads, you were never meant to parent alone. Yes, you need to be the first line of defense, and it is important that we are modeling God's character to our children. But if we don't come to the well of church, if we don't come to the well of community for ourselves, then we will fail. And just like Hagar, we need to fill our skin with the living water first. We need to take time to spend time with God alone because he is the perfect parent. And we can trust him to be with us on our journey just like we can trust him to be with our kids on their journey. As the perfect parent, God gave his only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. We have been given this gift of being heard and of being seen by the giver of sight himself. Apart from him, we are blind. Apart from him, we can't see perspective. We can't see our purpose. We can't see our way out of problems or pain. But he sees us, whether we recognize that he does or not. And when we accept Jesus Christ, for who he is and what he alone has done for us, then we can stand firm in the freedom of the promise that was first given to Abraham. And I love that in the book of Galatians, Paul also uses this example of Sarah and Hagar. In his letter, uh, Paul is reminding his listeners that the living one sees them and calls them by name. He is writing this letter to both Jews and non-Jews. All that means is that he's writing to people that are of the right lineage, that are of the right heritage, but he's also writing to those that are outside because both are struggling with what does it look like to follow Jesus. And they're torn between this legalism, right? Do I do things the right way? Do I check all of the boxes? Do I, as a parent, make sure that my kids behave so that society can see that I'm a good parent? Or are they finding their identity in what they do or are they able to see and find identity in what Jesus Christ has done and him alone? Are they able to see that their identity, are you able to see that your identity is one of forgiveness? It's one of grace. And through God's grace, he gave this promise of freedom. And through that promise, our yoke of slavery our yoke of shame, discouragement, failure, it has been removed. Galatians 3. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Christ has set us free so that we can be the best children, the best parents, the best aunts and uncles, teachers, friends. And he doesn't leave us to just fend for ourselves, but he sees us. He hears us and he calls us by name. That is our identity. That is our confidence and that is our hope. And that is how we can know that we truly are never alone. 
And so how can we walk in that truth today? Those of you who are here with us in person, you have an action card on your seat. If you're watching online or in an outpost, you can scan the QR code. But we're just going to take a minute right here and we're gonna fill this out so that you can walk in God's truth for you. Maybe you need to take that first step and just accept what Christ alone has done for you. Last week we got to celebrate baptisms and maybe that's your next step. Maybe you can find a way this week to show someone that they're not alone. Find a single parent and offer to entertain their kids. Or maybe you've been blessed with time or resources and that you could help an organization that helps kids. And so again, let's just take one minute, please fill this out and then I'll close us in prayer. Join me in prayer. God, we just thank you. We thank you that from beginning to end, you see us. God, even before a word is on our lips, you hear us. Thank you for the fact that you call us by name and that you are with us and that you are with our families today. God, we ask that you would give us your sight so that we can trust you no matter what stage of life we find ourselves. Give us friends that can walk with us and God, help us to be the kind of friends that other people wanna walk with. We just love you. We thank you for teaching us today and thank you for reminding us that we are never alone. We just thank you for being with us in every step that we take. We thank you for being the perfect parent who has given your one and only son, Jesus. And it is in his holy and precious name that we pray, amen. Thanks for watching this message from ACF Church. Uh, we hope it's encouraged you and challenged you to be more like Jesus and to walk with Him in a closer and more profound way. If you'd like to give to the mission of ACF Church, you can do so at the link on the screen or at acfak.org. We love you and we'll see you next week.